Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joseph Attic, Executive Chairman of ID for Africa, and I would like to welcome you to a very special episode belatedly commemorating International Women's Day. This is our 14th live cast, and today we look at identity systems through the gender lens. Before we embark on this exceptional session, I'd like to unveil the lineup for our next event dedicated to vaccination certificates and identity management a highly pertinent topic right now. Because of the record number of proposals received, we are producing two episodes on this subject. The first on April 8th will focus on the requirement for this new secure credential and the enabling policies, including data protection, standards, interoperability, and trust. It will consist of an amazing lineup of international organizations and think tanks. Basically, it's a who's who in this field, uh, from IKO, the World Health Organization, IOM, ISO, CETA, IATA, Center for Global Development, and London School of Economics. Really um, a heavy uh, session with very, very important thought leaders. The second session, scheduled for April 29th, will feature the top 10 industrial proposals for meeting the challenges of a new health credential to enable countries to reopen their borders and restart their economies. We are in the process of completing due diligence on over six dozen excellent proposals before validating the final lineup for the April 29th panel. I will unveil the chosen participants at the April 8th event. I thank everyone for their great submissions and I ask you to be patient a little longer to find out who was selected. One more item before we start today, I'd like to give you a heads up about a new call for participation that we will launch this coming Monday. It is for an episode called Democracy Under Attack. And we're gonna look at if robust ID management can defend it, which we are planning to produce for May 26. The date was set to avoid conflict with other events and Christian and Muslim holidays in the first half of May. Uh, but please submit as soon as possible. The deadline is April 26, uh, but I will engage with potential panelists as we go along. This is really another critical topic pertinent for our times. So let us bring out the best of our community in this event. In fact, if you have been following our live casts, you must have noticed we're going beyond our core ID for the activities to cover topics that impact not just Africa, but as recent events have shown the whole wide world. Whether it's dealing with vaccine management, health, gender inequality, privacy, or defending democracy, we're tackling large scale problems that affect societies everywhere. The common thread being responsible ID practices. In many cases, the African ID for the experience is proving instructive for a world suddenly in crisis and under stress. Back to today's topic. As many of you know, over the last 10 years, the development community, including ID for Africa, has been promoting identity as a pillar for socioeconomic development. It's now generally accepted that recognized proof of identity not only empowers its owners to exercise their rights, but is a practical and convenient necessity in their daily lives. Over the years and within the context of our mission as a knowledge sharing and dissemination organization, we have covered the benefits of identity for individual empowerment and for improved governance. But we have also been warning about the inherent risks that the wide scale reliance on formal proof of identity for daily actions can engender, especially for privacy, exclusion and discrimination. The recognition of these risks is what led the international development community, including ID for Africa, to advocate a set of principles that sensitize the authorities about the importance of building the right protections to ensure responsible identity schemes. These principles were just published in revised form last week, and we had covered them in our live cast number 10. One clear and present risk recognized by the principles is that of exclusion. An ID system that becomes the foundation for provisioning of services could deprive traditionally disadvantaged groups such as women from participating in society 
unless this identifier is realistically accessible to them without undue burden. In other words, badly implemented ID systems could aggravate already existing discrimination patterns, an outcome which is exactly the opposite of their inherent potential. We believe ID systems, especially in their digital form, and if done right, are enablers and their introduction should be an opportunity for revisiting the empowerment framework to help women claim their fair share, especially of the digital revolution pie. The topic takes on a renewed urgency today because COVID has accelerated the onset of digital transformation of life, whether societies are ready for it or not. And here lies a big problem. A large digital divide is already clear and present and does not favor women. Unless coordinated efforts are made to equip women with digital identities and the associated tools, we are looking at the deepening of this divide with the perpetuation of existing patterns of gender inequality resulting in hundreds of millions of women being stuck on the wrong side of the digital economy. This issue is not just about women realizing their full potential. It's also about developing countries building a brighter economic future for all. Without full participation of women, for example, Africa will be missing out on its development targets. So today's topic should be at the heart of the economic development agenda and should interest everyone women and men alike. To explore this topic, we have assembled an impressive panel of women thought leaders. We will begin with the evidence of gender inequality as it is in its, and its real impact in the field. This will include fresh data from African identification authorities on the gender composition of their ID systems. We will then explore root causes through a series of case studies from around the continent. All along, we will search for recommendations for how to adjust the process of rolling out identity programs to make them more women friendly. While we believe the ultimate goal is gender equality in ID systems, we are convinced this is a very difficult to do without gender equity first. ID programs cannot ignore the added burdens that women face to get enrolled into registers. We need policies and operational designs that rectify this unfair situation if we are to achieve parity of outcome. This is why we will explore remedial actions through pro-women policies and the women-friendly mobile platforms. We will then get the perspective on needed policy from an African leader whose career spanned over 35 years of public service filled with milestones of impressive accomplishments. This will then take us into the question and answer and debate session and community voices. As always, the audience can participate in today's session in three ways. First, <clears throat> you can um, participate in the chat, introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, network and enjoy the digital goodies, which are links and other um, useful uh, documents that you can download uh, related to the theme of the session. Of course, you can also ask your questions in the Q&A section at any time, but please, include your name, country, institution, and direct it at a speaker, because we are going to take them at the end and tell us which speaker you think should answer this. If not, just direct it at all, um, and we can I can select who should be. But also, very importantly, community voices, raise your hand to share your views live. An operator will elevate you to the panel, but please be on the lookout and respond to the operator uh, when they ask you to turn on your video or ask you to... Uh, be ready to get on the panel. Anyway, so <clears throat> before we welcome the panel, um, I'd like to thank our development partners, the Bill and Melinda Gate Foundation and Omidyar Network um, for supporting our live guest. Thank you so much for being with us and for supporting the African community around this important series of, of topics. Operator, let's bring the panel with us today and in no particular order, are Cheryl Harrison from the World Food Program, Hadija Dagabana from NIMSI, Nigeria, Lucy Hanmer from the World Bank, Anna Mushi from the FSDT Tanzania, Arshi Adil from MSC, Nana Fatima Mede, who recently retired from the Ministry of Budget and National Planning from Nigeria. We were supposed to be joined by Melanie Tijejenda from the Prime Minister's office, who's also the Deputy Ambassador of ID for Africa in Namibia, 
Unfortunately, because of a death in the family, she was not able to join. We also have with us Erdu Yongo from GSMA, Januba, Janabu Kamara from Seni, Guinea, Evelina Martelli from the Bravo program at San Egidio. And then we will also have uh, Jamie Zimmerman, uh, who's unable to attend at this hour, but who will be joining us an hour later. However, uh, we will begin with a special message from Jamie uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, at this stage, followed with her joining us later during the session. So operator, Thank you, Joseph, and greetings to all of you from around the world for today's livecast. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is proud to support ID for Africa's work. In particular, we appreciate their leadership to organize and host today's event in commemora commemoration of International Women's Day, bringing together this incredible panel of women leaders in policy and identification matters. It's an honor to share this virtual stage with each of you. The foundation is heavily committed to ensuring everyone has access to and can benefit from formal identification. Without an official ID, it is difficult, if not impossible, in many places to open mobile wallets and bank accounts, to register to vote, to register a business and land, to claim inheritance rights, to access government and humanitarian benefits and services. It's a critical enabler of exercising and benefiting from economic rights and a clear tool for empowerment. Yet on average, 44% of women in low-income countries, that's nearly one out of every two women, lack official identification compared with just 28% of men. That's an astonishing 16 percentage point gap. And if you're a poor woman, and especially if you're a poor rural woman, you are, you are disproportionately less likely to have an ID. This disparity is unacceptable at any time but certainly comes into sharp focus as we consider the stark realities women are facing around the world due to the COVID-19 crisis. Almost every disaster impacts women disproportionately because these disasters expose and exacerbate existing inequalities. The inequality, inequality we see in the provision of ID is no exception. In fact, the gender gap in ID is right now impacting women's ability to weather the current storm. Here's one example. Over the last year in the fallout from the crisis, more than 200 governments and territories have responded by expanding and scaling their safety nets. Many of them needing to innovate to digital means in order to rapidly target, identify, and get support to those in need. There are over 1 billion new recipients of cash-based social assistance as part of economic response and recovery efforts from COVID. A digital ID, is a critical tool to identify those in need and direct and deliver aid to them in a way that is efficient and inclusive. The gender gap in digital ID means that women around the world already bearing the brunt of the burden of negative economic impacts from the crisis are even less likely to be seen, much less supported in the implementation of response. The reality is that women can face a combination of legal, procedural, economic, and social barriers to obtaining official IDs. The gender gap has to be taken into account and a gender lens that sees and acknowledges these barriers has to be applied when creating the rules and technologies to develop, implement, and monitor these systems. And women most certainly have to be at the table as decisions around policy and implementation are made. We are in a moment of awakening and renewed urgency to achieve gender equality and women's empowerment. From the Generation Equality Forum and its focus on economic justice and rights, to the African Union's decade of women's financial and economic inclusion, to the work of the G7 and G20 and many others, we need all hands on deck to fill these gaps and make this moment one of opportunity for women's equality and not one of regression. And to be clear, closing the gender gap in digital ID is not just about getting COVID relief payments to women, but about economic inclusion and growth for our countries and globally. McKinsey Global Institute estimates that global GDP would grow by $12 trillion in 2025 if we close these gender gaps, particularly in areas like financial and digital inclusion, where digital ID plays such a critical role. 
equal is greater. It's greater for our households, for our communities, and for the world. I'd like to thank again the speakers for joining today and all of the participants from around the world for gathering to discuss this important and urgent topic. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, just a special message from ID for Africa quickly. Um, your engagement with us really matters. We need you um, to go to YouTube and if you like the sessions, like them officially and then subscribe and activate the bell. The more you like the, the episodes that we're producing, the more YouTube will propose them to a, to a bigger community. So this message of responsible identity uh, will be able to reach uh, beyond our core frontiers. So thank you so much um, for doing us this favor. If you really like it, let the world know. Now, operator, we would like to uh, bring our first speaker in the lineup, which is the World Food Program, and Cheryl Harrison. Oh, good afternoon or morning or evening to everyone, wherever you're joining from. My name's Cheryl Harrison and I work with the World Food Program. And before I say anything more at all, I want to just really thank uh, Joseph Attic and Shauna Taylor and the whole ID for Africa team for conceiving of and organizing this really important event. And I want to thank Jamie Zimmerman, who's our contact at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for uh, you know, really summarizing so well and capturing really well why we need to be thinking and doing a lot more to get IDs for women. Going from Jamie's excellent high level overview, I want to show you a bit about how the problem looks through the lens of 20 years of humanitarian work. Maybe you're wondering what the World Food Program has to do with any of this um, and, and why identity and especially women's identities matter so much to us. Some of you know that our mission is to end hunger globally and that we deliver food in emergencies to people and we deliver school meals to children in school and we treat acute malnutrition food, food, food. We always focus on the people who are most at risk of hunger. These are people living in really complicated situations, sometimes in very remote places, disaster zones, conflict zones. And uh, they're really super hard to reach. Um, and, uh, and because of that, they often get left behind. What you might not know is that about 10 years ago, WFP started transferring cash to people so that they could buy their own food. Now, starting out 10 years ago in 2009, we were transferring about $10 million uh, a year to in our cash transfer programs. But now for the last couple of years, we've been transferring more than $2 billion uh, uh, per year. Most of the people that we transfer cash to are women because the main responsibility for taking care of children and, and others in the household falls on the mothers and the grandmothers. A huge barrier to giving these women cash, as Jamie pointed out, is that they don't have IDs. And Jamie highlighted this very clearly. It's really mostly women who lack IDs and especially rural women with little or no formal education. Of the 600 million women worldwide that do not have IDs, 500 million of these live in Sub-Saharan Africa. This means that the women who with least access to IDs, uh, who are most disenfranchised, live in the rural areas of the poorest countries in the world. And frankly, these are the women that WFP works with every day. So the FINDEX tells us, the global FINDEX tells us that more women than men say that it is too hard to get an ID. More women and men say that they don't really see what they would use an ID for 
or that they can't get one because the, they don't have the documents that their government office is asking for. When we talk about how to get more women to have IDs, we often focus on barriers related to technology or government procedures. Sometimes we talk about barriers related to culture or education. But after 10 years of trying to get more cash into more women's hands, I can't help but conclude that one of the barriers that we don't talk nearly enough about is actually trust. And I wanna tell you about a project that WFP was working on. This must have been just a few years after MPESA um, uh, sort of took off in Kenya. We wanted to transfer cash to people's mobile phones. And, um, and as part of that, we were working with a group of women to get their IDs so that they could get SIM cards and receive cash from us. And um, the women were really pretty skeptical about the whole thing. Uh, they knew the process would be long. They worried that it was gonna be expensive because they were gonna have to travel uh, quite a ways to get to the town where the nearest government office was. And then they worried that when they got there, they'd have to deal with these very disinterested uh, government officials who would just ask them to fill out long, complicated forms that they didn't fully understand. The women were worried that they were going to arrive there without everything that they needed to bring with them uh, or that they wouldn't know when to go back to pick up their IDs. And they just had no information at all and they didn't know where to go for information. And they worried really a lot that they were going to get asked for little bits of money by everybody along the whole process. So it, in a nutshell, they had no faith in the process at all. And they didn't trust the people who were running the process. And actually, they were, they were right. Even with WFP advocating on their behalf, it took months. And the more time that passed, the less that the women actually believed that we were gonna be able to do what we told them that we would. When in the end, they finally received their money. I remember um, one woman coming up to me, her face just beaming. And she said to me, I feel like a school teacher today. And in Kenya where school teachers are considered to be real leaders uh, and pillars of the community, it, really brought it home to me how very empowered uh, uh, this was making her feel. I often get asked, why is the World Food Program switching to cash? And my answer is a mishmash of economics and human capital development and, and, and human rights, typical humanitarian answer, we never stay in our lane. But really it's, comes down to that money put directly into people's hands, especially directly into poor people's hands, and especially, especially directly into women's hands, multiplies in the local economy because it's spent immediately on the basic things uh, that people need. Food, places to live, medication, hospital bills, the money keeps children in schools, the money improves people's health, the money gives, it gives people a chance to breathe and think about how they can get a job or otherwise earn an income. Often we wind up having to issue our IDs ourselves, and here I'm talking about WFP, uh, because most of the people we're trying to transfer cash to don't have IDs. So uh, we issue IDs ourselves just to kind of be able to keep track of who we're providing assistance to. But this is really complicated and it's expensive and it slows us down in times when people most need uh, to receive assistance. And it makes cash transfers really difficult to do in a way that leads to sustainable financial inclusion. Yes, of course, we can get cash out to people, sure, but that's just a band-aid unless we can also help them to get accounts. If we could give more money to more women, 
we think that families and communities could recover quicker from disasters. We think that they could protect their families better during conflicts. We think that they could get back on their feet and get their kids back into school. And here, I'm not talking only about WFP's assistance. In the past year, pretty much every government worldwide was transferring money to their citizens to keep economies going and to help people through the pandemic. By the end of last year, WFP was helping 37 governments in Asia and Africa and Latin America with their G2P payments systems. These governments asked for our help because we have a very particular type of experience now. We know how to do large scale cash transfers to people who are um, very hard to reach. But an even larger source of support for people are their own family members. In 2019, more than $500 billion was sent in remittances, much of this by hardworking people who had traveled abroad and were supporting family members back home who were in places that there just weren't that many opportunities. Now, if only we could bring the cost of those remittances down, even more of that money would make it home. There is of course an overlap in the 1 billion women who are excluded from formal financial services and the 600 million women who don't have IDs. Linking women into the formal financial system means that they can access support from all of these sources when they need it, humanitarian, government, and their own families. And of course, again, getting women IDs is a prerequisite to all of this. Lack of IDs contributes to hunger. And like hunger, it is a solvable problem. And I have to say, I am so excited about learning from the other presenters today because I'm confident that solutions are emerging and that we can use this gathering to mobilize our collective resources around those solutions. But as I wrap up here, I just want to emphasize one more time that while we're developing this, these solutions, we need to put the women themselves at the center of the effort. Jamie talked about having women at the table. I'm gonna take it one step further. We need to have the women themselves at the very center of the conversation. We need to build their trust. We need to gain their respect because once we do, they will tell us what we need to know. They will help us to fix the problem. So I wanna thank you all very much for listening to me. And I really hope that this has been helpful. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to answer them later or feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. And Joseph, um, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, as we <clears throat> continue the, the session, please uh, post your questions in the Q&A uh, for any speaker you wish or any generic question you like, we can address them. Um, in the meantime, uh, I will ask the audience, if you are aware of cash transfer programs where women have been privileged more than men, I will tell you one program which we covered uh, in previous episodes was a program of cash transfer in Togo, where actually women were given more money than men precisely because of the arguments that Cheryl has so eloquently made. Okay. Um, thank you, Cheryl. We'll come back to you later in the session. In the meantime, um, we want to do a level setting. We want to do um, get the pulse through a poll. We want to know who's watching. Um, so please, operator, put the first um, poll on the screen. We would like to ask you a gender question, the basic one, the most basic one. What is your gender? How do you identify? So please answer that so that we know uh, if we're, we're having a gender uh, equality or we have basically um, a bias in the attendance. Uh, so operator, okay. So we usually stop when it's about 60% of the attendance is there. Okay, uh, 70%. Okay, L let us end the poll here. I can tell you the result. Uh, basically, what we see from the results and for the benefit of those who will be watching us on YouTube, 63% attending this event are actually identify as women and 37% identify as men.
Okay, so clearly we do still have work to do to make sure that that men do attend a session of this importance. Okay, um, let's keep going. And the next part, we would like to talk about the real evidence and concrete data on the gender composition in identity systems. And for that, we would like to bring in the first uh, Hadija Dagabana from NIMSI, Nigeria. So Hadija. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you very much. Glad to be here again. Um, so, Hadija, the first screen? issue, yes, please share your screen. The first issue we want to know where you have been doing wonderful work at NIMC bringing digital identity to the masses. So, we'd like to know how is that going, what's the progress, and how do women fit? into your progress, okay? Um, well, is, uh, there's been a lot of progress, um, more especially with the enforcement of um, the harmonization of the same uh, with the national identification number. And then the enforcement uh, in the educational sector, whereby those uh, children sitting for the uh, graduating examinations will have to uh, harmonize um, their identity, present their identities using the national identification number. So that has um, really seen the upsurge of registrations uh, because uh, in the last, uh, from December to date, we have enrolled more than 10 million, which is an outstanding increase as against uh, the previous years that we enrolled about 10 million or so within 12 calendar months. So within three months, we are seeing that result. And the numbers are, are growing daily with more than um, 100,000 records daily. So that's where we are as uh, the general enrollment. But with respect to uh, the enrollment as um, it relates to the genders, um, what I did was to bring up the record as at 2nd of March. And uh, from what we have, um, we look at, uh, sorry, let me go back to the, uh, the first slide, uh, sorry. Sorry, just. Um, going to the first, uh, first slide, as at, um, as at 2nd of March, this is where we are. Out of the total number registered, which was uh, 48 uh, million 321,000 uh, plus, we have um, uh, the average of um, uh, the number of, uh, that is 24.9% that is, uh, of the total estimated population of the country. So we still have um, a long way to go. And then I broke that record to reflect the under 16 and the, uh, uh, and then registrants that are above 16. For under 16 population, we have um, a total coverage of 39% uh, male from what we have registered, um, and then 51%. So the number is higher. Uh, the female registration is higher compared to the male. And for the above uh, 16 years of age, um, we have a female population of 19.3 million as against 27.3 million. So for the older generation, uh, the number of female is uh, higher than the male population. And then I, I identify you some mean, species. Hadija, Hadija, excuse me to interrupt you. You mean the gap, there are less women who are registered with a NIN than males. You, you basically, yes. 19 million women have a NIN, a national ID number, while yes. 27 million males um, that's 8 million women less than male yes. over 16. Yes, okay. over 16 years of age. Mm -hmm. And then um, I took some uh, few states from the different regions, uh, like Borno, when you look at Borno, Taraba, there is uh, unrest going on in those locations, uh, insurgencies, and you look at Bielsa, the, which is the oil uh, produ one of the major oil producing uh, states, and with a lot of uh, conflicts going on there, and then on those states in the south also, to see whether those factors affect um, the turnout of women. But uh, surprisingly, when you look at um, uh, 
the south, southwest, which is Ondo, uh, which uh, you can see they, they are, they are, there is more enlightenment in, those, in that region. The number is almost uh, equal to uh, me, uh, female to male. You can see few um, variants in uh, south, south, but when you look at the north, uh, northeast and the uh, northwest, you can see that's where you have the gap, and uh, which is due mostly to the insurgency and the movement of uh, the families from uh, disaster areas to the cities. So, uh, I'm, I'm sure that's one of the main issues that is causing that disparity. So this is the uh, zonal uh, uh, statistics as it is based on what we have in the database. Mm. And then I, uh, the, the, going uh, back to, the, the, to a World Bank report that um, estimated the number of uh, 24 years and below to be close to four, more than 52% of the Nigerian population. So I extracted the data to see where we are in the, with that category. And in that category, uh, you can see that the female, the, we have issued name uh, as at uh, 8 of March, uh, a total of um, 4.3 million as against the male uh, 5.6 million for that active mm -hmm. uh, category of population. So as it is, as at this morning, we have uh, more than uh, 48.9 approaching the 49 million mark. And then, as I said earlier, the database is growing with over 100 million records daily. And uh, when you look at uh, the number of, uh, we have licensed more than 230 private sector agents to make sure that we have a larger coverage and easy access to the population. And uh, out of those, two, uh, from those 230 companies, we have trained more than 4,000 agents. And I look at the statistics of agents that we have, because in some location like the Zamfara Ambono I mentioned, which are the far north, uh, we know because of some uh, traditional and religious um, uh, beliefs, uh, some of them may not like males to enroll their female population, especially the married ones. So we look at uh, the number of agents we have on the field, and uh, we have um, about 1,680 female agents that have been trained. Uh, not all of them are right now on the field because most of the companies are still procuring their enrollment devices and setting up at new centers. And when you look at the enrollment going on for now, most of the enrollment is uh, in the cities. So they, we will see more enrollment when we get to the hinterland and the, uh, and the other remote locations. And what we are trying to do to make sure that we do not disenfranchise um, the women when we get there is to make sure that, like I said, we encourage the licensees to have uh, more female agents going to those locations and uh, start discussion with um, traditional uh, religious uh, leaders so that we can educate them and they will educate the men in their communities to make sure that they allow their female the dependents to be registered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hadija. Um, we're going to come back to you <clears throat> later in the session about what kind of policies you think we can be effective in, in bringing up the number of NINs uh, for, for women in your country. So think about that, that question, uh, including the idea, perhaps maybe ridiculous, maybe sound, the idea of giving a, a bonus for women, um, for example, if, if, a, if a registrar produces a unique NIN for a woman, you might pay f something more Absolutely. than it is a male. So think about that as an idea perhaps to incentivize these registrars to um, give priority to getting more NINs for women. Clearly there is a gap. Um, we need to fill that gap. What I've seen is that this gap is actually geographic we are going to learn more in the World Bank presentation about the origins of this gap and how, how to address it. So, Hadija, thank you so much. Hang in there. I will come back to you later in, in the session. Um, now we would like to bring in Madame um, Kamara, who is from the, um, the CENI, which is the Commission Electorale Nationale Indépendant, is the Electoral Commission. 
operator, can you elevate the, the, the interpret with us? Okay, um, so Madame, Madame Kamara, uh, merci beaucoup pour uh, votre présence parmi nous. Um, so Ms. Kamara, thank you very much for your presence among us. Merci beaucoup. Okay. Vous, vous, pouvez, vous pouvez lancer votre, votre présentation, euh, ce qui est qu'il faut qu'elle lise sur la même question, de répartition euh, de femmes, hommes, répartition de sexe dans le, le registre national utilisé en Guinée. So we're going to talk about a similar topic, which is the share of women and men in the electoral uh, registry in uh, Guinée. Merci beaucoup. Je suis euh, Madame Kamara Guénaboutouré. Euh, je very suis much. la directrice officielle électorale. I am the deputy director. Um, um, excuse me. I am uh, the direct, the commission, the director for electoral register department at the Independent National please, Electoral Commission. Can you please go full screen, uh, screen mode? Uh, oui, merci beaucoup. OK. Merci beaucoup. Euh, ici, vous avez une euh, représentation du nombre d'électeurs euh, femmes sur les listes électorales. Here you have a representation of the share of the women in the electoral registry. En 2010, on avait 40% de femmes inscrites sur les listes électorales. In 2010, we had 40% of women uh, registered in the electoral lists qui correspond à 1 756 000 femmes inscrites. Which uh, corresponds to 1 756 000 women registered. Et vous voyez nettement qu'il y avait 60 d'hommes qui étaient inscrits. So 60 of men were registered. Et vous voyez que cette tendance a été renversée en 2020. This tendency was uh, flipped into 2020. Nous sommes aujourd'hui à 53% de femmes sur les listes électorales. So now we have 53% of women in the electoral lists. C'est que nous équivaut à 2 793 109 femmes. Which corresponds to 2 793 000 uh, women. Donc, nous avons quand même travaillé à mettre des stratégies en place pour que les femmes s'enrôlent. So, we have worked to set up strategies for women to enroll, to register. Il était question d'avoir euh, des femmes opératrices de saisie. We uh, had women as uh, operators for the registration. pour permettre aux femmes d'accepter ou à leur mari d'accepter que leurs femmes s'enrôlent. C'était pour que to, les femmes puissent... Uh, to allow women to uh, do the registration and to uh, allow men to allow their wives to do themselves the registration. Parce que les listes électorales sont biométriques en Guinée. Because the electoral lists are biometric in, in Guinea. Il y a les photos, il y a les empreintes digitales. There are pictures and uh, digital prints, fingerprints. Il y a toutes les informations d'état civil. And all the information of civil registry. Et donc, vous avez là la participation des femmes euh, so, aux élections. So here you have women participation in the elections. Et vous pouvez voir en termes de statistiques sur 2013, 2015 et 2020. And you may see in terms of statistics for 2013, 15, and 2020. En 2013, on avait seulement 46% de femmes qui participaient au, au vote, aux élections. In 2013, we had only 46% of women participating in the votes. Et en 2015, on était à 46,96%, une petite progression de femmes qui ont participé à l'élection présidentielle. In 2015, we had 46,96%. Et vous voyez, en 2020, il n'y a que 44% de femmes qui ont participé à l'élection présidentielle passée en octobre. And in 2020, only 
38.32% of women participated in the elections. Donc, nous avons progressé sur l'inscription des femmes sur les listes électorales. So we progressed in matters of uh, notifications of registration of women in the electoral list. Mais nous n'avons pas progressé dans le vote des femmes. But we didn't progress in matters of voting of women. Donc, cela s'explique par les pesanteurs socioculturels. Uh, this is explained by heaviness in the social cultural background. Et religieux and religious as well. Parce que le plus souvent, on ne laisse pas la possibilité des femmes d'aller exprimer de leur vote. Because very often, men don't let the, their wives to go express their votes. Ce qui est important dans notre expérience guinéenne, what is important in our experience in Guinea, c'est que toute une stratégie a été élaborée par la commission électorale, is that a whole strategy was elaborated by the electoral commission, pour mobiliser les femmes, to mobilize, to engage women, et permettre à ce que les femmes aient une identité, and allow women to have an identity, parce que nous sommes confrontés à un problème d'identification des femmes, because we do have a problem of uh, women identification. Les femmes n'ont pas d'extrait de naissance, généralement. Um, a lot of uh, women, women usually don't have a birth certificate. Parce que la déclaration chez nous est faite par le papa ou le mari. Because the birth notification is done by the father or by the husband. Donc le plus souvent les femmes naissent et ne sont pas déclarées en zone rurale principalement. So mainly in rural areas, very often when women are born, they are not uh, notified. Donc ils n'ont pas de pièce qui leur permet de s'enrôler sur les listes électorales. So women don't have a document that allows them to be enrolled in the electoral lists. Donc nous avons intégré dans la loi. So we have integrated in the law. L'attestation. The certification. d'identification. The uh, identification certificate. Qui n'a rien à voir avec l'extrait de naissance ou la carte d'identité nationale. Which has nothing to do with the birth certificate or the national ID card qui est établi par l'autorité locale, which is established by the local authority, avec le témoignage euh, de, des notables, with a testimonial of a notary. Donc cela a permis à, à, aux femmes de, de s'enrôler sur les listes électorales avec euh, euh, ce document. So this allowed women to be registered in the electoral list with this document, the certificate. Et il faut noter aussi que ce, la carte d'électeur aujourd'hui permet aux femmes. We have to note as well that the electoral card uh, allows uh, women today. D'avoir un numéro de téléphone. To have a phone number. D'avoir accès au crédit, au microcrédit. To have access to small loans, microcredit. D'ouvrir des comptes bancaires. To open bank accounts. Et de l'utiliser pour des transferts également and uh, use it for transfers, money transfers as well. Ils peuvent recevoir de l'argent venant de l'Europe, de l'Afrique, un peu partout, à travers leurs pièces d'identification électorale. So through this uh, ident electoral identification uh, document, they can receive money from all over the world, Europe, or other countries in Africa. Pour uh, la participation des femmes dans la gouvernance politique en Guinée. For the participation of women in the uh, government in Guinea. Les statistiques ne sont pas réluisantes. The statistics are very positive. Vous avez aujourd'hui 27% de femmes qui participent au gouvernement. You have today only 27% of women participating in the government. 17% au parlement. 17% in the parliament. Et 12% au niveau de la gouvernance décentralisée, donc dans les régions. 12% in the regions. À la CENI, vous avez 23% au niveau central. À la CENI, vous uh, avez uh, 23% au niveau central. Uh, Et nos représentations, ils sont que 7%. Et nous avons seulement 7% dans ces représentations de smaller parties. Smaller voilà un peu ce que nous pouvons donner comme statistiques et études de cas dans notre pays. So this is what we can give us statistics and cases study in our country. 
et le travail continue pour que les femmes puissent s'inscrire et voter davantage euh, pendant les élections. And the work is continuing for women to be able to be registered and uh, vote more during our elections. Donc je vous remercie et je retourne la parole à Dr. Joseph. So, I thank you very much and I pass on uh, the word again Madame, to Dr. Joseph Attic. Madame Kamara, merci beaucoup pour cette présentation pleine de données utiles. Uh, on okay. va revenir vers vous avec des questions uh, lors de la, la science de, de débat. Thank um, you very much for all these useful information and we will go back to you for the Q&A later. In fact, to relate um, to what Madame Kamara said to our traceability uh, argument that we made last episode, um, I will basically remind you that what we said, legal identity, which is required for voting in Guinea, um, is an identity that's traceable. And so we said traceability, either you do it via the birth certificate, or if you lack birth certificate, you will do it basically via the attestation of your, the people who vouch for you, the elders of the village who can attest that you are somebody in that country. And so they have activated this um, because women were very disadvantaged. They've activated the traceability channel that goes through uh, the attestation in order to bring the numbers um, of vote uh, of registered voters to that level. So uh, good progress on the registration. I think we have more work to be done on the use of the ID when it comes to expressing political choices and preferences. But in the meantime, these women are actually using that ID, which is a voter ID for e almost everything else in life, which is um, having a phone, getting a bank account, etc. So even if they are not yet there represented politically, um, they are still benefiting from having that ID. So bravo, um, Madame uh, Kamara, et merci encore une fois. Okay, um, operator, I'd like to do a poll. Uh, let's do one more, just a, a quick one before we continue with the root causes, trying to understand what's happening. Okay, so a simple poll. Do you think identity schemes continue to be predominantly designed by men? Pensez-vous que le schéma d'identité continue à être principalement conçu par des hommes? And this one, please, if you are a woman, answer it. Men don't answer that. There's another question for the men. This is only for men. Uh, this is only for women to answer. Okay. So let's see, let's see where that, that ends up. I'll give it, I'll give it a few more seconds, but the trend is very clear. Um, okay, operator, let's, let's stop this poll because the trend is overwhelming. Uh, for those who are not watching live, we'll tell you that 87% uh, of the women who are attending said yes, and, and only 13% said no. It's clearly a clear um, agreement that these identity systems are predominantly designed by men. And that's something we need to keep in mind in, in going forward, trying to address this problem. Actually, operator, can we run the same poll? I'm just curious. I know we have fewer men in the audience. Can you, we run the, sa the same poll for the men population and see what, what, that hap what that comes out to be? So men, please vote. Okay. I think I think this is going to saturate there. Um, here, let's end the poll. I think men are statistically in the same range. They 81% uh, believe yes, they are being designed by men, and 19% being uh, this, say no. So therefore, um, whether whether you identify as male or you identify as female, there is a consensus that these systems have an inherent design bias because they don't think of women, they are thinking from the perspective of men. men. Okay, so that's great. We're gonna continue the session. If you have any questions, please put them on in the Q&A, they are being accumulated. 
but you haven't been directing them to the speaker, please also tell us who you're from, what country you're from, what organization you're from, because as I start taking them, I'd like to call upon you. Uh, it'd be great to have you in, 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 the, in the discussion. Okay, so operator, now we're gonna move on to the next session, next part of the session, which has to do with the root causes. And there are qualitative studies that are really fascinating that have been done by various international organizations. And the first one I'd like to welcome is Lucia Hanmer from the World Bank Group. So Lucia, uh, the, the field is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Attic, and good morning or good evening or good afternoon to everyone who's joined this session. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be joined this panel of experts on to mark International Women's Day and to be addressing such an important topic. So I'm going to pick up where many of our previous speakers have left off and look at some of the root causes of um, barriers to women's identification and the gender gap. So I'm presenting a study on barriers um, of the inclusion of women in marginalized groups, which was conducted in Nigeria. And it's an in-depth qualitative study um, conducted by a large team uh, at the World Bank in partnership with Oxford Policy Management in Nigeria. We in Nigeria, um, as um, our previous speaker from NIMSI has um, illustrated so well, there is a huge challenge in terms of the uh, size of the country, its diversity, and that the, when we started the um, research, only 20% of the national population were registered. You will have seen that um, the, uh, in great strides have been made and more people have been, considerably more people are registered now but that there is also a gender gap. So Nigeria offers a huge opportunity to understand the barriers as this, this was now a year ago or so. And also because of the um, government of Nigeria's commitment to increasing uh, uh, the numbers in the population that have an ID and to closing the gender gap in access to ID. So our study is a large one for a qualitative study. We talked to over 1,000 500 Nigerians in focus group discussions. We covered all the six geopolitical zones across 12 states, and we went to local government areas in urban and rural areas. Lucia, are you gonna share your slides? Oh, yes, I am. I thought I was sharing, sorry. No, no, your slides are not visible. Okay, thank you for interrupting. Uh, let me try again. If not, we can we can run your slides for you, but please. Um, okay. So is that visible? Yes, that's visible. But please put okay. it on on full screen uh, on yes. on full screen mode. Okay. So here's yes. the title of the study, which I covered. Um, the challenge, which I was also talking about. And this screen uh, may be helpful for others because it shows um, the coverage of the study uh, and um, the um, number of people that we talk to. So what I'm going to present is as follows. The headline findings from the report, which uh, cover the awareness of national ID, how Nigerians that we talked to knew about ID, what they knew about it, the barriers that they discussed um, in obtaining an ID and their suggested solutions to overcome these barriers. And our study focused on women and girls, but we also talked to men and boys. And we had special focus group discussions with, um, for persons with disabilities, internally displaced people, and with pastoralists. These are groups that are quite often more marginalized in society. So on the importance and awareness of ID, Across all the different groups, we looked, we talked to groups of people of older men and younger men mm -hmm. and older women and younger men, women. So across all these groups, everybody knew about the idea in Nigeria, but the knowledge was uneven and sometimes incorrect. Most thought it was equally important for women to have an ID as a man, but many, both male and female respondents thought that men needed a national ID more than women. 
And there was some confusion about what you could use an ID for once you got one. In terms of the perspectives on the importance of registration, it was clearly an issue of a, a matter of pride to have an ID. And many talked about um, the IDs establishing their identity as Nigerians, as citizens of the country, and as indigents belonging to Nigeria. They travel inside the country, the ability to have an ID to produce uh, to security uh, forces uh, inside the country was often mentioned and people thought that an ID would be in, um, useful in case of accident or um, to trace missing persons. What was particularly interesting was uh, from the leaders of the more marginalized groups that we talked to, that they stressed that um, the ID helped um, their communities integrate and also help them um, claim as a, at their rights and entitlements. So you'll see there from a traditional leader from a leprosy group, he said that he thought that it gives you the morale to stand out, to stand among people. And he talked about going to a police station to claim to ask them to, for assistance. Um, in, ter in terms of um, gender-based barriers, what I think has emerged from the previous speakers and is common in a number of studies is we see that women face interconnected constraints that um, create barriers for them in terms of accessing IDs. First of all, we have the social norms about women's roles that allocates the majority of the work in the house and childcare to women. And this uh, means that the time that they have to leave the house in order to go and travel to get an ID is more limited. They also almost always need men's permission to go and register to leave the home. Um, in some cases, and for some of the communities, um, they said that they, women could just go out and register whenever they wanted to. But in the vast majority of people, both men and women, said that either the permission of a husband or a father needed to be granted. So the other common co um, barrier, which is um, for all, would be the cost of transport, which is for rural and urban. So these barriers for women interconnect to make it more difficult for, than for men to go and get an ID. What we, um, how we conceptualize our findings is that we see that across Nigeria, there were common barriers faced by men and women in rural and urban centers. So at the time that we um, did the study, the common barriers were the uh, distance to having to travel to an ID, the cost of transport getting there, and the long waiting time spent often in facilities which were not um, equipped for the task. Uh, so these are barriers for all, and um, especially um, poor people in, in rural areas, the barriers increase. What happens for women more generally is they face an additional layer of barriers. So these are ones that I've talked about already, the getting permission to enroll, uh, the constraints of, um, to leaving the home, the time constraints, greater difficulty getting documents often, as our previous speakers have pointed out, and also um, Childcare, pregnancy, or having younger children uh, means that they quite often to take them with, have to take children with them to the facilities. So, um, if, when we dig deeper and look at the barriers that face groups that are often marginalised, again there is another layer of barriers that they uh, that they incur. So, for people with a disability, for example, the travel costs may be doubled as they may have to take somebody else with them to the centre to help them. If you're, an if you're poor and illiterate, then you, then you have more difficulty uh, filling in forms and um, dealing with the authorities. In the North, as our, um, as our colleague from NIMSI has mentioned, there are particular social norms about um, how you interact in public as a woman. And these mean that this means that, um, that um, capturing biometrics, removing um, hijabs photos or interacting with men create another layer of barriers. So uh, these are a summary of the main barriers that we found. When we went to communities to ask for the solutions, we found that there were many practical solutions, both for men and women, which would help overcome these problems. And overall the problems that helped, uh, that lifted barriers for all 
had big advantages for women and girls as well. So I will illustrate some of those. So the raising awareness, everybody agreed that uh, more awareness for the ID and its importance was needed, more communications. The most popular way was communications through word of mouth. And here, um, trusted members of the community and community leaders played a very important role, both religious leaders and um, leaders, um, traditional leaders. For uh, women, it was particularly important to, you, to employ women leader, women's leaders to, um, trans to transmit the messages to women, to women in communities. And both men and, men and women agreed this would be a very good way to um, increase the motivation for women to get an ID and to make sure that men were on board with this message. Um, we, the other solution which um, communities, uh, you know, um, really emphasized was bringing the enrollment closer to the, to the people. And you will have heard um, from our representative from NIMSI that the NIMSI are, have indeed already started to do this. So communities wanted to be able to register in primary schools, in religious, in places of worship, and in uh, places where they transact business. Now, so for women, this has a double advantage because it means that they, uh, they incur less transport costs, have to wait, be away from the home for a uh, few hours, and that permission is more likely to be granted to them from their husbands or their fathers but, uh, if the place is a place that they go to habitually anyway. So the other solutions were from the communities were very much to employ staff from the community, to, encourage, to lift barriers of trust, language and culture. And um, to, they also thought that this would lessen the opportunities for drive taking and poor treatment. In the North in particular, separate preferential treatment was uh, preferred for women. And this is again, as um, the representative from NIMSI has already um, talked about in order to lift cultural and religious barriers and to lessen the time taken to register. People preferred to have women register women and they preferred to have separate registration for men and women in some, in some parts of the north of northern Nigeria. Solution, partnering with the private sector so that um, more, uh, a wider range of people um, could get out to communities was also um, strongly favoured. There was some hesitation about the opportunity for corruptions and scams or the misuse of data, but um, having the government certify or vouch for the private sector providers or NGO partners, most people were at ease with that. Uh, in conclusion, um, what I can see is that research from Nigeria shows gender-based barriers that are identified. Um, and they exist in many other countries and they crop up globally all over, the, all over the world. So the barriers are not unique to Nigeria. I think uh, the quality of research um, that we had the opportunity to do, to do in Nigeria can help policymakers um, to design solutions and get um, solutions from women and men in the community who as uh, Cheryl and others have mentioned uh, are the best place to know the solutions that would, um, would fit their communities. And again, although the barriers are common, um, gender-based barriers are common across the world, it's important to note that the intersectional barriers of race, ethnicity, class, and income will be very specific to countries and regions. So that is what, that's why doing qualitative research like this will um, help many policymakers. So Joseph, back to you. Thank you. Lucia, thank you so much for this insightful um, presentation and for the underlying research, qualitative research, that's definitely a helpful input for policy. We've got a lot of questions uh, for you, so I hope you're able to stick around with us till the debate and discussion session so we can uh, try to address some of those questions. Um, operator, let's move on to the next presentation. Again, some qualitative uh, data and, quality and quantitative insight from FSDT from Tanzania. And I think Anna, Anna Mushi is with us. Welcome, Anna, and thank you for being with us. 
Yeah, the thank floor you. is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joseph. As uh, yeah, my name is Anna Mushi. I'm the head of uh, Gender and Youth uh, at uh, Financial Sector Dependent Tanzania. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, thank you very much for joining our session today. Um, so uh, my, I'll be engaging in this discussion from the uh, financial inclusion uh, perspective and uh, trying to uh, um, visibilize uh, uh, national identification or national uh, ID as an enabler to uh, 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 women economic empowerment. But at the, at the same time, put a lot of emphasis on the importance of having a gender responsive ID acquisition process. Anna, can you do full screen a moment, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, so um, maybe uh, to start with, uh, in Tanzania, um, national ident ident identity number is a key requirement by law to for registering a, a SIM card. And this is a, a overseen or implemented by our Tanzanian uh, Communication Regulatory Authority. And so it's important for it's key for anyone to have a mobile phone, then your SIM card must be registered using a, a NIN. So looking at it from a, a, a inclusive finance perspective, I personally see huge opportunity uh, to help bridge the uh, gender gap in financial inclusion, at the same time promoting women inclusive finance, uh, as inroad to their economic empowerment. So as you can see in my slide in Tanzania, we have made uh, progress in terms of ensuring that uh, our population is included, but then we still see 11% uh, gender gap in uh, 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 mobile money uh, uh, usage in terms of uh, people uh, using mobile wallet. Uh, we see uh, 9% gender gap in terms of people who are having uh, bank accounts. And uh, many women are concentrating in the informal uh, financial services. And uh, this is not to say that uh, informal financial services is not benefiting women, but we know in a situation where uh, formal financial services is responsive to women needs then women will be able to get uh, 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 services that are relevant to them and they'll be able to grow quickly in terms of their uh, economy and of course their well-being, uh, their family well-being and of course and, the, and themselves. So at the same time in Tanzania, like any uh, other African countries, uh, mobile money has proven to be a uh, a very uh, uh, important instrument or driver to promote uptake of formal financial services, even despite the existing gender gap in phone ownership between men and women. Still, it has proven to show that mobile uh, um, service, uh, mobile phones, has been promoting uh, uh, women uh, financial inclusion. Now, why am I saying uh, using? national identification number or national ID is an opportunity to, to, to register for SIM card registration is an opportunity. Uh, try to imagine uh, a digital uh, national identification number as a very powerful KYC for financial service providers to understand these women and then sit down and design and innovate relevant financial solutions and products for these women. So at the same time now, linking the power of this national ID, trying to imagine now uh, uh, with this uh, mobile wallet, how these women, especially the low income women, will be able to receive, um, to receive money directly to their mobile wallet, but at the same time having access control and are built to make a decision over their finances. 
again, trying to imagine now with this kind of wallet, where it also uh, provide an opportunity for financial service providers and other stakeholders in the uh, financial uh, uh, services ecosystem to be able now to start thinking on how best to innovate uh, uh, within those uh, uh, within those uh, mobile wallets to make sure that there are other use cases that are responding to women needs. For example, use cases that are promoting uh, women more ability to save use cases that are enabling these women to absorb shock. Think about maybe women uh, entrepreneurs in the micro, uh, medium, and uh, small and medium uh, enterprise space. So if they are able, for example, to be accessing uh, health services through their wallet, uh, insurance uh, to cover their health services their, for themselves and their families, insurance to cover their small businesses, insurance uh, to cover uh, the uh, agriculture, for example, and so on, then you could see now uh, this kind of uh, uh, innovation and support uh, promoting uh, growth of these women. Imagine with the power of ID, how it can also help uh, these women to start building their financial history, which in time, in turn, uh, we should be able to see how this woman is uh, saving, how is she taking loans? How is she uh, uh, servicing her loans? Which at the end of the day, it can be used as an alternative collateral and change the whole narrative of how uh, collaterals are defined uh, uh, today. Because most of these women, especially the low-income women, do not have uh, assets to be used as a collateral to access uh, uh, b b b loans and other financial services in the formal financial sector. But as, again, we are very much cognizant that if this uh, uh, ID acquisition process is not gender responsive, does not underscore, appreciate, and realize the realities of these women, then this uh, uh, move is a huge uh, threat to their gender equality. And the whole idea of uh, uh, financial uh, services or finance as an enabler uh, to women economic empowerment. So uh, it's so important, and this is what FSDT have been advocating in terms of providing thought leadership, uh, providing insights and other uh, technical support to make sure that uh, 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 the, uh, the National uh, Identification Authority is able to realize the, the needs of these women and especially the need to have context specific deeper understanding of these women so that at the end of the day, they are able to innovate uh, 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 approaches or process that is relevant to them. So they really, and this is not only for us, but as, uh, to all the authority in the developing countries, especially, there is a huge need to understand who are these women so that at the end of the day, we are able to design uh, gender responsive uh, processes. I'll give an example, uh, for example, in Tanzania. It's so important to understand women capabilities. What are they doing? Will they be capable in terms of responding to the process? We have heard from Lucia, uh, uh, her presentation on the challenges women are facing. So for example, in Tanzania, we have 18% of women who have not received any form of financial or any form of formal education, yeah? So their numeracy skills, arithmetic skills, the ability to read and write both in Kiswahili and English is below the national average. At the same time, overall, many women, they have low decision-making ability. What does it mean when you're designing now uh, the process of ID acquisition, uh, 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 of ID acquisition, yeah? So we know uh, in Tanzania, for example, women uh, form a large, uh, the majority of the labor force, but to a large extent, they're in unpaid work and they are primary caregivers. So if you have this kind of knowledge, you know, so what does it mean in terms of you uh, designing intentional process that at the end of the day will be able to, uh, to reach these women? So the other thing, uh, despite uh, these uh, uh, challenges that are making them not capable, but you're talking about uh, the uh, more than 50% population of the country. This is a market. If you're able to think 
about the power that lies in the ID, the national ID, in terms of transforming the life of this population and the overall uh, economy of a certain country, then this is an area where we should go there running to make sure that ID is used as enabler. So now, if you see all this uh, Anna, one characterization, one, yeah, thank one you. Minute, yeah. Anna. yeah, so it means that these women are not designed to, uh, to respond to the needs of the market. They are designed to become wives, to become the primary caregivers. So what does it mean to the uh, idea acquisition process? It means uh, the registration process is not supposed to be cumbersome. Those forms are supposed to be very simple and whenever necessary to have a support and how best to fill them. If, uh, uh, because you, uh, as you have said, women have a lot of workload, what does it mean? If they have to travel to to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to travel from y, from point A to point B for registration, then it means they will not go. And imagine if it's also issue of transport is involved. So it means that these services are supposed to go closer to these to to, uh, to, uh, to these women. And given the characterization, these women are more likely not to have a, um, a birth certificate as a form of their identification of their nationality. They are likely not to have uh, knowledge of their uh, family origins. And this is not to say that we should compromise the process of uh, uh, ID uh, acquisition, but really this process is supposed to be gender responsive. This process is supposed to respond to the needs of women Otherwise, these women will be left uh, behind. And at the end of the day, uh, the financial gender gap will continue. And I think most of us, we know even the global data is showing nothing has changed much since 2011, you know. So at the end of the day, as much if it's uh, like, if uh, this process I designed from the male face, honestly, mm. uh, Africa will not uh, realize uh, uh, the uh, sustainable development goals, especially the goal uh, number five. Thank you very much. Anna, Anna, thank you. Thank you so much for this insight. I think um, anybody who wants the details of the presentations, you can ask the uh, ID for Africa operator, we'll make them available to you. Um, another thing to, to comment on is that I am, op I am pleased to see that you are optimistic about the potential of the linkage, the potential, positive potential of the linkage of the SIM to the NIN, to the NID, um, which is something that you have done successfully in your country. Um, hopefully in a year time, we will look at the gender uh, impact. And Nigeria is in the process of doing that now, requiring the SIM and the NIN to be linked. Uh, we strongly believe at ID for Africa that that's a good thing because it promotes immediate um, mm -hmm. an application mm -hmm. that brings people to the system. And now we're going to come back to you in the, in the panel. There are questions that are being asked, so maybe you can contribute to those. Once again, thank you so much. Uh, operator, we'll move on to the next segment very quickly. Um, and that will be um, Evelina Martelli from Bravo Program, and who is going to quickly give us an overview of what she's finding um, in the field. Evelina, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the ID for Africa team to spread knowledge on identity and ways to overcome barriers for the more, most vulnerable people. I thank very much also the previous speakers uh, uh, that have presented very similar conclusion to ours. I will speak about uh, civil registration and particularly about birth registration. Sant'Egidio, an international faith-based organization, started the BRAVO program, what means birth registration for all versus oblivion, in 2008 to promote civil registration with the aim of granting legal protection and fundamental rights, especially for the most vulnerable children. Um, so, sorry. Okay. We are currently cooperating with four African countries characterized by low CRVS system performances, Burkina Faso, Mozambique, sorry, Malawi, and the Republic of Guinea. The intervention's key aspects are guaranteeing the system's continuity through universal infant birth registration supporting the opening of civil registration offices in existing health centers, 
clearing the backlog of the unregistered population through free late registration campaigns and cooperating with relevant national authorities to improve the legal and administrative framework for civil registration, to heighten civil registrar skills and office procurement, to strengthen interconnection between government departments, to enhance computerization and data sharing and exploitation. Along the years, the program supported birth registration of nearly 5 million children and parents. Working on the field in close contact with national authorities has allowed us to acquire in-depth knowledge of the strong points and weaknesses of the national civil status systems. Acknowledging legal and cultural barriers to registration led to action and legal advice to state authorities in order to overcome obstacles to registration. In the countries where the program is active, mothers are not legally prevented to register their child. Burkina Faso, Malawi, Mozambique, and the Republic of Guinea are not among the 35 countries in the world that require the father's name or presence in order to register a child. Nevertheless, there are barriers, albeit non directly legal, which led to discrimination against women. In this area too, data are lacking. So I strongly support the efforts put in place by ID for Africa, the Center of Excellence for CRVS Systems and many other players to uncover barriers and hidden biases to gender equality. A data ecosystem is strongly required. The first discrimination is the economic one. If for young children, there are no statistically significant differences in the registration of males and females, starting from adolescence, we begin to detect a deviation of several percentage points between the registration of males and that of females. To give some examples, in Mozambique, the 2017 population census detected birth registration coverage only for children aged 0 to 17 years. The census shows that 71.9% of minors are registered. Differences in registration rates between males and females become statistically significant from 15 years of age. In rural areas where 67% uh, of Mozambique's population lives, the difference at 17 is 4.5 percentage points to the detriment of girls. In Burkina Faso, the 2006 census uncovered a difference in the registration between women and men of all ages of 13 percentage points to the detriment of women again. These differences can be partially explained by the fact that late registration has a fee and families tend to economically invest preferably in the lives of males than in that of females members. For women, a future of marriage, maternity and employment prevalent in the informal sector is envisaged, thus not requiring legal status. The national free registration campaign conducted between 2009 and 2020 throughout the national territory of Burkina Faso with the support of Bravo has provided birth certificates to about 3.5 million people, especially children and among adults in great majority to women. The difference between registration of men and women fell to 4.7 percentage points in 2014. To overcome the economic barrier, simplified and free of charge procedures are strategies that have proven to be very effective. Gender-friendly procedures have to be envisaged. In Burkina Faso, Mozambique and many other countries, at the time of marriage, the woman generally moves to the husband's family. The laws of these two countries, as well as many others, provide that even late registration is only possible in the municipality of birth, making it more difficult for women to complete late registration procedures. The Bravo program always promotes free registration, both timely and late, and carries out campaigns in which even the indirect costs of registration tend to be zeroed, for example, by bringing the registration team 
directly to the villages and reducing the distances for users. It also proposed legislative changes to allow late registration procedures to be started in a municipality other than that of birth and to provide for procedures that allow exchanging information and documentation between municipalities to compile and finalize the dossier for late registration, allowing people to register without having to travel to the place of birth. A serious obstacle is the cultural barrier of the stigma of being identified as a single mother. For the registration of newborn, there is a cultural break for mothers to register the child in the absence of the father. It's not always about single woman. The father, in fact, can be unwilling, but also unable to register his child because of migration or absence for work, for instance. Often, women are discouraged from registering the child in the absence of the father, both by the family and by the registrar. To ease and spread timely registration is a way to improve gender equality. In Burkina Faso, there is no data on timely and late registration, although surveys seem to indicate that the vast majority of the registrations take place with late procedures. We have sampled registers for birth for several years and several municipalities, both urban and rural, highlighting that about 80% of the registrations are done with late procedures. In Mozambique, the 2017 population census detected that only 32% of infants have a birth certificate, compared with 89.3% of 17 years old children. Once again, it is confirmed that registration takes place mainly with late procedures that are more expensive and put under five children at greater risk of being unprotected and going uncounted and unnoticed. And as we have seen before, also for women, late procedure is a hidden barrier. The opening of registration centers within health centers, which the mother attends for prenatal visits, delivery, and later on for vaccinations, represents an incentive to register the child because it eases the procedure and make it, makes it one of the many tasks to be fulfilled in the first months of life. Birth registration of newborns is facilitated by the creation of a supportive environment, both by the nurses who advise to register and the registrar who is trained and knows the legal provisions which allow a single mother to register the child. This is a key aspect of our intervention. In 2014, uh, Bravo started timely registration in health centers to ensure the sustainability of the system and the move towards a permanent and continuous civil registration system. In 2020, in full pandemic, we guaranteed the constant opening of the registration centers. We have provided all operators with individual protection devices and equipped all centers with hand washing materials for users. Only in 2020, with the intervention of Bravo, 71,000 children were registered in 2027 health centers in Burkina Faso. About Lina, one minute. Yes. Sorry, about, one minute, Evelyn. Yes, about 23,000 in 12 health centers in Malawi and more than 35,000 in 14 health centers in Mozambique. We developed civil registration models in the entire administrative areas as a pilot action for state intervention. The program supports birth registration in all health centers of the center west region of Burkina Faso, serving a total population of 1.6 million inhabitants. In this region, newborns registered at birth are 71% of the expected newborns, according to the local statistical institute. In the district of Balaka in Malawi, with half a million inhabitants, we have a total coverage of the territory and the registration of newborns reached 91% of the expected birth in the year. So 
I believe that these results show that universal infant registration is an achievable goal, even in contexts characterized by gender disparity and barriers to registration by women. A real free and accessible registration system accompanied by staff awareness and information for new mothers can realize universality of infant registration, thus together with the right to legal existence for every child, gender equality can also be attained. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this insightful presentation filled with qualitative uh, data that really can make it clear to us what policy interventions we need. I, I found this concept of late registration being an important concept um, which contributes to the uh, the gender in inequality and the need to make it free of charge uh, to eliminate that. Um, operator, before we, we, we get into the next uh, presentation, uh, run, run a slide, uh, run a poll, just a quick poll, um, because Evelina basically cited some laws um, which could be barriers. For example, um, when, when somebody moves to their husband's district and they are forced to go back to their original district. Okay, so uh, Paul, should your country's laws be changed or do you think your country's laws may need to be changed before gender equality and ID linked entitlement can be achieved? Is, 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 are the legal frameworks that exist today fine or do you think we need to revisit the legal frameworks? Okay, so let's see if, you can, if we can get uh, some sort of a consensus on that before we continue. Um, we will we will come back to Evelina, and and basically we're going to continue the session now with some policy uh, discussions. Okay, so the please put up the results. The results is basically almost fifty fifty. You've got forty six percent say yes, we need the laws change, and and fifty four percent saying no, the laws are fine. Okay, um, this could also be diluted by the fact that we are doing the whole world. Uh, we have about 130 countries in the world represented and therefore not all development status have been, have been segmented. Okay, so let's keep on moving by welcoming MSC who uh, will, will give us um, a presentation on the policies, policy recommendations for improving gender ID inclusion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Datik and the entire um, ID for Africa team. Um, thank you for this opportunity to um, join a wonderful panel of colleagues talking about such an important topic today. Um, so let me quickly uh, show you the roadmap of um, today's presentation. First, I'll be talking about the GUTSA framework. Then we will apply this framework uh, into each of the stages of identity life cycle. Moving to the next slide. So uh, we strongly believe that IDs can act as a medium to support women's agency. We have hence developed the Guta framework. Uh, sorry, Miss Arshi. Hi, Arshi. Hi, Arshi. I'm sorry. Good one moment. Something has happened to your video. Um, we are not able to see you properly. Are you um, able to maybe change your virtual background? Maybe you could dismiss your background. Is it any better? Yeah, something has gone wrong with the, the visual. Um, you can remove the virtual background Please. if it's if it's yeah. easier for you. Okay. Or get closer to the camera. Yes. Is it any better? I guess so. It's a little better. You'd have to stay very close to the camera in that position, if yeah. that's okay. All yeah. right, thank you. Thank sure. you. You can continue. Sure, sure. So I was just unpacking uh, the, what the Guta framework is. So um, we strongly believe that uh, IDs can act as a medium to support women's agency. We have therefore developed this framework to not only build uh, gender, sensi gender sensitive identity systems that help address the various barriers that um, women face in obtaining and managing their identities, but also support a convergence of use cases so that women are able to benefit from them. 
this framework is a combination of principles and action points where the principles uh, influence the action points. So let us just um, know more about Guta. So according to Guta, the ID system should be gender sensitive, meaning all beneficiary facing interfaces should be gender sensitive, not only in design, but also in implementation. ID system should be oral friendly. Uh, globally, a large percentage of women belong to the oral segment, meaning they have very limited ability to read and understand. They are more comfortable with the verbal communication instead of the written forms of communication. However, most processes for applying to IDs include communication in formats that are not oral friendly. Um, next, what Gucha pro, uh, advocates is the ability to overcome social norms. So there are a plethora of biases and social norms that work against women throughout the process of accessing the ID and even using it. So Guta advocates that the ID systems should be cognizant of social norms and should be designed to overcome these norms. ID systems should also be transparent so that there is no information asymmetry amongst women and, may, and, in, and instead it makes them more confident to navigate through the opaque institutional systems. ID systems should be able to communicate well about the various steps, nuances, and processes involved uh, in terms, in languages that women are comfortable to understand and very re relevant and relatable to them. ID systems should be able to harmonize with the existing databases, meaning they should help collect and convert existing data for women, thus limiting the need for additional uh, paperwork and complicated processes like documentation, etc. ID systems should also be adaptable so that they can mitigate the mobility constraints that women face owing to cultural norms, geographical constraints, or even sometimes um, uh, due to even political phenomena. Uh, moving to the next slide. So uh, following the framework, we have developed certain design principles for each of the stages of identity life cycles, including uh, registration, issuance, use, and management. Moving forward, uh, the first stage is registration that usually begins with uh, collecting and recording attributes from people. With the help of Gucha, we aim to make this entire process flexible, accessible, inclusive, and accommodative. Sure. So uh, moving to the first principle, an effective ID system uh, so what we've done essentially, we've broken down these uh, design principles into key steps. So for the first uh, design, uh, so, so for the first stage, we have these three key steps that we are following. One is communication, onboarding, and monitoring. So on communication, an effective ID system uh, should not only communicate the operational details of registering for an ID. For example, where to register when to register, but it should also communicate the need, the benefits, and if there are any associated incentives with the identity. Um, I would like to quote an example here. So in India, registering uh, to a family identity program in one of the states in India uh, provided free health insurance and cash benefits to women, which was one of the biggest motivation for women to register for the program. So in a nutshell, what we want to say is that in apart from the operational details, these important information about the benefits, etc., should also be communicated to women. Uh, moving to the next stage, um, which is onboarding, the Gucha framework advocates for decentralized and mobile registration points. Uh, many previous surveys have shown that the poor women find cost of travel as a binding constraint for registration. Therefore, uh, the registration system should be decentralized and sometimes they should even allow agents to travel to home locations if there are any mobility issues that women face. Um, there is a need to adopt gender sensitive approaches like um, running women only registration days and um, kiosk. Um, for instance, uh, for Pakistan's national identity, uh, registration centers staffed by women were established and th that helped women overcome their reluctance to register. 
So the point that we are trying to make here is that these gender sensitive approaches allow women to come out from culturally sensitive areas to register on a huge scale. <clears throat> now, um, as I mentioned before, a large percentage of women belong to the oral segment, which is why it becomes important to facilitate assisted registration for this segment. Moving to the next principle, which is ensure a collection of accurate information for women who lack adequate supporting documents. So this is a point that the previous panelist also highlighted. So the chance of incorrect information be, being fed into the identity systems is maximum for those who do not possess an ID of their own. For instance, um, in India, we found many women with the same date of birth, uh, incorrect mobile number, same addresses, even, even addresses registered on their ID cards. So um, what the government needs to do is to relax certain conditions for obtaining an ID, like allowing for a witness or, or issuing a temporary government certificate, and sometimes even reducing turnaround time for these certificates, like birth certificates, et cetera. Uh, women are more likely to account for missing documents and they are more likely to even miss enrollment days, um, sometimes due to childcare responsibilities, sometimes due to family responsibilities. Therefore, it becomes important to design alternative mechanism. But when these alternative mechanisms are designed, it is important to keep in mind these gender specific challenges that women face. Um, the next uh, design principle is on monitoring. Monitoring should also be done during the data collection stage to ensure that the gender-based targets are being completed. To motivate the last mile workers, governments can sometimes think of uh, our, uh, announcing rewards and recognitions uh, on completing enrollment targets. Now we'll proceed to the next slide which is um, the next slide uh, talks about the issuance stage where identity providers usually issue one or sometimes even more credentials to assert the user's identity. Now with Gucha framework, we advocate designing and issuing credentials that are inclusive and easy to use. So again, we've clubbed this into certain design principles. Uh, Gucha advocates that gender sensitive and oral friendly design of credentials that allow minimal use of credentials, uh, characters and letters with more focus on plain number based systems. This ensures ease of use uh, and also security against any kind of misuse. Uh, next principle is on communication. Uh, and transparency. So many a times we've seen that the enrollment application gets rejected, but it does not get communicated to the applicant who, who then ends up applying multiple times or sometimes even give up on application. So which is why proper communication or acknowledgement of status of enrollment is essential to save duplication of efforts of lost time and money. Uh, further, the entire process of delivering the ID or the credentials to the user should be designed in a way that there are minimum time gaps between enrollment and issuance of credentials. Uh, minimum trips and travels should be required to um, issue or to reduce and because that sort of reduces opportunity cost of leaving work, childcare and the financial cost of traveling. Excuse me, Arshi, just letting you know you have one more minute. Sure, sure. Thanks. Okay. So um, the next stage in the identity life cycle is of use. So I'll just quickly talk about the principles in this stage. So uh, what we are trying to say is that concepts like privacy, consent, etc., which remain unknown to women should be communicated to eliminate any possible harm arising of their misuse. And it also becomes important to sensitize men who dominate almost all stages of identity life cycle. Um, sometimes it becomes important to uh, streamline processes with regards to technology because women have been facing disparities with access to technology and that is a known fact. So, for example, when exception mechanism, uh, uh, exception mechanism te uh, techniques are being designed, more than often we see that OTPs are being used. Uh, but what doesn't go into consideration is that more women are not even likely to own a mobile phone. So, so we need to think beyond OTP, we need to think what more alternative mechanisms can be designed for women. 
Uh, the next is use cases. So for ID, it becomes important to even highlight use cases. As I remember, some of my previous panelists was talking about cash transfers. So one of the use cases of ID is around simplifying targeting and enrollment in these cash transfers or welfare delivery programs. Uh, that is by identifying and linking the ID systems with program databases. This will sort of initiate push-based benefit distribution, and it will be easier for women to access benefit. Now we are coming to the last um, stage of the ID systems, which helps us uh, create mechanisms to uh, address gender-specific challenges that women face. So um, process information that allows resolving issues specific to women, uh, for example, changing surnames after marriages, correcting date of birth, or, or moving to a different location after marriage. All of these processes should be looked at and should all, and the policies around it should also be looked at and changed. Oh, excuse me, Arshi, I'm sorry, we have to cut you now because we're running out sure, of time. Sure, I'm almost okay. done. So with this, no. I would like to uh, end my presentation and uh, going forward, we can uh, apply this framework to understand the extent uh, to which these ID systems uh, around the world are gender centric. And um, we'll share the link to the full working paper uh, in the well, digital uh, So thank you so much. It's thank a you. very, very good framework. I encourage everybody, everybody to analyze it. It's detailed step by step, as you have seen. We cannot cover it in 10 minutes. So we'll make available the presentation slides as well as the links in the digital goodies for anybody who wants them. Okay, sorry, now we're gonna continue uh, in looking at the empowerment that comes through the mobile platform. Erdu, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Let me just share my screen. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. I am Edor Yongo, a policy and advocacy manager within GSMA's digital identity program. And I will be speaking to you about the importance of mobile in gender matters. For those of you who are not aware, GSMA is a mobile trade association, meaning that we represent the views of our members who are mostly mobile operators. Before I begin with my presentation, I would just like to thank the UK FCDO for their continued support of our programme. So, the number of people with a mobile subscri subscription reached more than 5.2 billion in 2020. There is no other platform that has the same reach as mobile. Mobile technology is already in the hands of 82% of women across the world and is providing them with life enhancing services. In addition, mobile has the potential to positively contribute to protecting the human rights of women, which includes their right to an identity. Mobile also has the potential to to help um, women socially, economically, and politically develop because by design, mobile is gender neutral. Given the widespread reach of mobile, there are a number of new opportunities for mobile operators to play a major role in accelerating and developing digital identity ecosystems, particularly in the countries across the African region, region who are embarking on digital transformation strategies. As you can see to the left of my screen, on the supply side, mobile operators have a number of core business assets, which make them ideal partners to help governments enroll the millions of women and girls who lack access to a form of identification. This is because mobile operators have a strong expertise in processing customer personal data. They also have nationwide um, presence of retail and agent networks, which government can tap into to really enroll um, the women and girls who lack an identification. 
Finally, mobile operators have strong established privacy and consent mechanisms which often go above and beyond a country's legal requirements. An example I will draw upon is Nigeria, where mobile operators have been approved as government partners to enroll Nigerians in the National Identity Database and in providing them with a national identity number. If you turn your eyes to the left of my, to the right of my screen, you can see that mobile operators also have a role to play on the demand side. So mobile operators can play a role in driving demand for digital identities amongst women and girls. They can do this by using dynamic and static attributes um, that are unique to customers to create products and services that are specific to women and girls and therefore driving identity uptake amongst them. In consumer research across seven countries, GSMA found that 53% of respondents would prefer to receive government or social benefit payments on a mobile if a mobile operator digitally verified their identity without them having to be present. We also found that 82% amongst the 80. 82% of individuals were very or fairly likely to use mobile services where their mobile operator had verified their identity remotely. An example of mobile operators driving demand for digital identity is in Zambia, where mobile operators are using Know Your Customer know your customer records to verify the identity of beneficiaries at the point of registration so that they can access social benefit payments through a mobile money wallet. In all, this all emphasised that mobile can be part of the solution in addressing um, the barriers that women face in accessing an identity as well as you know encouraging women to to access a digital identity though i've painted quite a positive picture so far um, and that though there have been major strides using mobile to empower women the stark reality really is that women are still more likely than men to lack access to mobile technology as well as mobile services in their own name. Early findings from GSMA's upcoming mobile gender report show that across low and medium income countries, women are estimated to be 7% less likely to own a phone than men. For the first time, GSMA's digital identity program also conducted research to understand the link between access to identity and access to mobile in one's name. As you can see from the graphic on this slide, Based on our analysis, we found that amongst those with a SIM card in the seven countries, women are 9% less likely to have a SIM card registered in their own name compared to men when all factors have been controlled for. Our survey results found that amongst SIM owners in the seven countries, there is a large gender gap and around one in four women do not have access to a SIM card in their own name and instead use someone else's. When extrapolated, this means that an estimated 190 million women across the seven countries do not have an, a SIM card in their own name. So why are women less likely to have a SIM card registered in their own name? 
I won't dwell on this too long because a lot of the previous panellists touched on this in depth, but we found essentially that women don't have a SIM card in their own name because firstly, female respondents use a SIM card that has been registered by a family member or a friend. Secondly, we found that females don't have a SIM in their own name because a family member deems it inappropriate for that female to register for a SIM card. This was the case for 19% of women compared to just 8% of men. We also found that female respondents don't have access to the official ID that is required to register for a SIM card. But what was most interesting is that 20% 20. 20 of females said they don't know why they don't have a SIM card in their own name, which means that there really is an issue around awareness. Yes? I'm so sorry. We have just one minute left for you. So okay, then I'll, quick, to... I'll quickly wrap it up then with sure. my um, recommendations. Thank so you. we have a number of policy recommendations that you can see on this slide. Um, but most importantly, we know that the gender gap in access to identity is not going to close itself. It requires a concerted effort from all stakeholders, which means that governments such as government ministries such as the National Identity Authority needs to work collaboratively and partner with all stakeholders to address the, the needs of women as well as the barriers that are currently preventing them from accessing an identity. We also believe that there is a huge issue around awareness. Um, so 22% of women are aware that they can access identity linked mobile services. So government need to work with mobile operators in promoting these services as well as di digital literature, literacy. And then finally, I would like to again recognize the UK FCDO for their continued support of the Digital Identity Programme. And I would also like to thank Identity for Africa, as well as my other colleagues for their assistance in helping me prepare for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, again, anybody who wants the presentation will make it available. Uh, through the digital goodies channels. Thank you. So stick around for, for the discussions at the end. Um, operator, please bring in uh, Nana Fatima Mede. I'd like to get her perspective on all this. Um, actually, we're very honored and pleased to have Nana Mede with us. Uh, she's been a champion for women's cause in Africa. Uh, her career spans 35 years uh, of government civil service civil service in Nigeria. Uh, she's gracefully retired most recently from being the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Budget and Planning. Um, and she has overseen many successful projects um, that have brought reform, whether it is uh, to the um, payroll reform, which is a very, very famous system that has uh, saved uh, Nigeria billions of Neras or to um, creating programs that would improve women participation. Um, Nana Mede, uh, please un unmute your, your, um, your computer, your microphone. Welcome. And you've seen all of the previous speakers talking about this. Um, what gives you hope? that this is something we can overcome. How serious is this problem in Africa, in your opinion? And what gives you hope that we're going to get it, get it done? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I'm Nana Fatima Mede. I'm currently a consultant, a financial industry consultant and the CEO of Babarabi Foundation. I want to thank uh, Mr. Hattie for giving me this platform to share my experience and to say what keeps me going forward in respect of women uh, issues, uh, closing of the gender gap uh, in, in terms of identity 
um, issues in Africa. Let me say that my experience both as a government employee who works on the payroll reform of government, as well as a private citizen, not only an NGO, I will say that the issues, the, the importance, uh, the relevance to close the gender gap in identity issues cannot be overemphasized. It is very important. In fact, it is as important, it's as necessary as last, as yesterday. What gives me hope, listening to all the presentations today, first of all, starting from my country, is that at least Nigeria is coming to reality, Nigeria is coming to terms with three practical steps to bring in women into reckoning as far as policies and actions that needs to be taken for the advancement is concerned. When I did the payroll, when I did the payroll reform for eight years, it was difficult to get people to understand what the government was about. Prior to that, budgeting was based on estimates. There was no accountability. We didn't even really know the number of employees that were on the payroll of the federal government of Nigeria. We could not plan for their training. We could not plan for their, for their capacity building, you know, training too. We couldn't even do a budget that will ensure that as they retire, the money that is necessary to pay their pensions were available because we we're just doing it based on estimates. And at the end of the financial year, whatever was left of such budget was simply misappropriated on things that had nothing to do with payroll. By the time we were able to aggregate, to come to bring together the number of federal government employees, because we now introduce, you know, try to know their identity, where they are from, are they women, are they men, what is their grade level? The government now was basing its personnel budget on actual figures, actual personnel of the civil servants. That helped to curb corruption, that helped to promote transparency, that enabled us to streamline payroll processes, that you know, instilled confidence in the payroll processes and costs, that also enabled us to deduct payee and all the other statutory deductions from government salaries and source and remit to the relevant people because initially people were just deducted taxes and not remitted to federal ILA revenue service. The monies were left in the MDA's account and used as dim fit. But when the payroll was introduced, all of those were eliminated. We could budget on the actual number of the civil servants. We could remit all the necessary deduction payers who earn national housing for deductions, various uh, other levies of government, two and a half percent contributory pension. We were able to deduct all of these things as source. And they saved the government a lot of money, which was not available for other important benefits. And again, we knew the number of women that were in the civil service. We knew the men that were in the civil service. So in terms of trying to say, okay, who people should that require capacity building, we were able to, at the point of a body, we were able to get out those information. Now, as a CEO of uh, Barbara B Foundation, the organization that are currently also run, because there's no proper identity, it costs a lot of money for us to travel to the villages, to, uh, to look for community leaders to identify the women before we can now know the kind of assistance they require. It's a whole lot of stress and it's a waste of money. Money that could have been used to help them, we spend it on traveling to first of all know how many they are or who, are, who they are. But now I'm hoping that with what NIMSI is doing, and I want to congratulate my country and commend NIMSI for the job they are doing, I'm sure very soon we will have the data that is required, that is necessary to aid planning, to support government in budgeting, to promote uh, transparency, to add wastages, and to reduce corruption. And I'm happy too that with the funds, the support that we are getting from World Bank, Africa Development Bank, NIPC will be able to disaggregate the data. And from the suggestions that have been made today by the World Bank, 
Abina, Abina, Miss Yongo, and even the Tanzania experience, we will not be able to deliver programs that will support women. Financial inclusion, welfare programs, planning for aid facilities, education, access roads for women to go to farms and bring their produce to the market, and it will be a different story for Africa. So I'm really excited. I have hope and I'm looking forward to all of this going forward. Thank you very much. Nanamid, um, thank you so much. We would have loved to spend more time with you, but I will close this segment by showing you one slide which shows the reality of the challenge that we are faced with. This is a, a segment, uh, th this is a slide taken from the Interparliamentary Union study, which basically shows the percentage of women in parliament by country. And we see Nigeria is under 4%, 3.8%. Um, how, how, how long do you think it's going to take for us to see parity? Uh, in other countries, there's Rwanda, Namibia, South Africa, they have done some progress, but we're still in the other end of the spectrum. The challenge is great. And until women participate in the political process, um, I think we're gonna continue to have policies that are designed by men and systems that are designed by men. Operator, remove the slide and, and let's have Madame uh, Mede respond to this. What do you think about women's participation in the political process? I think it is very important and we need to start immediately. In fact, we've already started. When I look, look at the various programs that uh, Nigeria women put forward uh, just on, the, on Monday, the, the International Day for the Women, I know that there's, we are mobilizing. There's that, you know, everybody, is saying that what we have currently is not enough. We have a national assembly that has about, about, uh, about uh, 409 or so far as 69 members of the national assembly. We just have 19 women. We have yeah. eight in the Senate. We have 11 in the House of Representatives, a house that has 360 members. Now we know that it's not good enough, but the government, even the president, you know, in the, in the, I think the government, the pressure is on government because they came out on Monday to list the number of women that are occupied positions in government. But even then that is not enough. So what we are trying to do is to mobilize women. And we are saying that political parties come 2023, 20, political parties must agree to a certain percentage, you know, for women. And it is not from the level of political parties because if you are not giving a ticket, if you are not, if you do not win at the primary level, you cannot contest election. So we are saying that right for the political parties, we are going to hold meetings with them. Anybody, and people, parties that will not support the women to have certain positions, women should just not vote for them. So we want to right. be able to influence the outcome of the elections. And the Minister of Women Affairs is in the forefront of this. The National Council of Women's Societies are not sleeping. The wife of the president, everybody is on board. And by 2023, just about two years from now, I'm sure the story will change. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we, we will be accompanying you in, in this movement. And it's clear that women need to embrace political participation if other participation, whether it's financial inclusion, identification, or economic, uh, are gonna improve in Africa. So anyway, thank you so much. Um, operator, bring all the other panelists on and we are gonna try to very quickly answer some of the open questions um, and also take some community voices. I know that we're exceeding our time, but we're doing this for the benefit of those who are gonna watch this on, on YouTube. So if you are unable to stay with us till the end, uh, that's okay, we will have the a recording and for the benefit of this, um, of the of you who wanna who wanna continue on on YouTube. Also, it's a historic historic occasion. Okay, um, operator, bring in the first um, community voice um, to the panel, and actually bring in maybe a couple, two or three community voices. Um, maybe while you're doing that, I will um, I'll I'll take on some questions that have been asked. Uh, maybe. There was a question um, for Hadija from Yanis Theodoru. What percentage of the 100 million unregistered citizens in Nigeria are expected to be enrolled through private sector enrollment partners like the MNOs? So Hadija, question for you. 
Yes, um, as stated earlier, we are just approaching the 25% mark uh, for the full enrollment. Um, so there's already a 75% um, out there that are waiting to be captured. And uh, they, there's no restriction as to the number they will capture. So as you're licensed, you're out on the field, uh, the responsibility is on every licensee to capture as many as possible. So 75% okay. of the population is out there. Right, and Hadija, uh, you pay per unique successful enrollment, right? Yes, yes. And you have you considered a program where you would give um, a higher premium on a unique female enrollment than male? Is that something that you're considering? Well, it's not something we have uh, put on the table, but it's something that we are going to consider going forward. The kind of okay. incentive that uh, we discussed with the um, ID4D team of the World Bank is um, incentive of uh, hard to reach locations and locations where there are some restrictions. So th those are the areas where incentives were kind of discussed of around those areas, but uh, mm -hmm. reaching women and, uh, and children is, should be one of the incentives that we'll consider. We are still on, at please. the discussion stage here. Please, please consider that, consider it a request from the movement and keep us informed if, if you are able to implement a program of that nature, because it's very concrete. It, we'll it's results that. oriented. Okay. So, so, sorry. Thank you. Um, in uh, addition, no. Okay, let me. Uh, you can say, you can say what you want. Okay, mm -hmm. I wanted to add that in addition to the incentive, there are some policy decisions that we are looking at to take, at least make proposal to our parents ministry to see how those uh, policies can be implemented, approved and implemented. And one of such is um, to kind of give a percentage to each licensee to make sure that as they go down to the hinterland where you have most of these customary practices, to make sure that there's a percentage of women enrollees, uh, trained agents that will be deployed. And then to, to pro provide a guideline for house to house enrollment to make sure that these women in their houses or in their place of work, in the farms or in the market uh, are reached uh, by this agent um, and enrolled. And also to have um, maybe at the district level and the religious uh, institutions to have women's section, whereby women okay. that are able to leave their houses can approach uh, those centers to be enrolled. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, operator, uh, please, please bring in uh, the first uh, community voice. We, I had three of them, but they, they disappeared in a second. Um, we also have um, had the World Food Program. They have another conflict, so they are unable to continue with us. So operator, could you please uh, elevate? Um, if yes, not- Yes, sure, Dr. Um, Attic. We have Rifat here with us. Rafik, could you- Yes, your video, please, please turn on. Introduce yourself and where you're from, what country you're from, and uh, state your, your uh, point of view. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Adric. Uh, it's been a wonderful panel uh, listening to all of you and these wonderful women leaders. My name is Rifa, uh, and I am based in Bangladesh right now. I'm working for a company called Simprints. It's a biometric technology company that's actually working for creating impact uh, through uh, engaging with different uh, social uh, organizations. And we've been working with 14 countries across Asia and Africa. So one perspective that uh, I would really love to share and put forward uh, to um, all the panelists today is uh, a health initiative and a learning from one of the health initiatives that uh, Simprints has been doing in Bangladesh uh, with uh, our implementation um, a partner and organization, BRAC. Um, so in this initiative, we have been really focusing on uh, reliable identification and service delivery to mothers in rural uh, Bangladesh, uh, across like half of the country, 32 districts of Bangladesh. And while doing this initiative, something interesting that we came across in the design and implementation period was like when um, the technology, the biometric technology is based on uh, collecting fingerprints and creating unique identification for these mothers. But the initial challenge was getting their buy-in and making sure that 
uh, you know, that they agree to provide their consent and also making them understand what co the concept of consent is, uh, because culturally, like as many of our speakers have all already uh, talked about, uh, that consent is something, I, I mean, like engagement is something uh, in women, it's sometimes very hard to engage because of um, not being empowered enough in those communities. Um, so okay. we address this. Please ask your question. Um, yeah, so my question uh, and, and a little bit of comment around would be, uh, like, what is the effect do you think is around behavioral change uh, interventions that can make for engaging uh, both men in, in these communities to make sure that they're not a hindrance, uh, to making sure that women um, participate in the inclusion? Because in our program, we did see that like engaging with uh, men counterparts along with their women did, did really alleviate how, how the services were integrated and undertaken. So would be really interesting to hear your perceptions uh, around it as well. Thank you so much. Let, let, let's see, Lucia and Evelina, maybe you, have, you can react to this, bringing in the men as you sensitize both men and women at the same time. How do you feel about that? Were, were your yes. studies done in the presence of men or were women yeah. only? Yes, I can comment a bit on that. Um, and it's, it's a great question. Uh, focus group discussions included both men and women. And um, in terms of raising awareness, uh, both the men and the women impressed uh, about how important it was that men were aware of the importance of an ID, what it was needed for, and how it was going to become more important in future. And many women commented that um, there would not be much problem with getting permission if their husbands or their fathers understood how important an ID was for all. So the issue then of influencing community leaders also becomes important. Uh, the leaders themselves thought that they could um, help um, promote identity, uh, the need for identity within their communities for uh, the need for women's identity, for women to have identities in particular. And these were religious um, leaders and um, other community leaders. Lucia, there has been a couple of questions for you as well along those lines. Um, what was the age segment of the women that participated in the discussion, your group discussions? And were there any differences that you noticed depending on the age? So we, we know the, the you incorporated men, mm -hmm. but what is the age groups and did you find any differences between the different groups? Uh, yes, we uh, divided our focus group discussions into um, people who were under 25 year olds, adults under 25 and adults over 25. And we held discussions separately with men and women. So in terms of the differences, there weren't very many differences in terms of either awareness or the identification of barriers or the solutions. The main differences we found is in terms of preferences for communication of awareness campaigns where both male and female youth preferred the use of social media, of SMS text messaging. Uh, and uh, whereas the elder people in the community really emphasize word of mouth. And okay. so that was the main difference, but there weren't too many. The other difference was that younger people were more likely to um, report uh, so, sort of a, um, a bad behavior issues with involvement staffs as being off-putting or report being treated rudely than older people. Okay, okay. And anybody else wants to add to that specific issue, um, sort of the demographics of whoever is telling you this information, their age, their gender, or, or else we can move on to the next, um, the next community voice. I would like to in intervene. Evelina. Yes, thank you. So I agree with, uh, with the importance of involving men also in the, <laughs> on the table. Uh, of course, uh, the husbands and the, um, the men who accompany the women, but also the civil servants who are often more represented males than females. And just to give you some examples, also in the training we are um, we are organizing together with national authorities, often the question, why not to register a child with a single mother or with a mother without ID documents 
is an idea of be of making a good work, not allowing frauds or uh, some false uh, um, declarations by women. So uh, bringing uh, bringing the perspective of the mother and the 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 best interest of the child in the picture and explaining that if you have some concerns about uh, a false uh, declaration, of course you have to address um, the, 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 uh, the instances uh, of, of a false declaration. But in case of a declaration from a woman who has no identity documents, uh, the legal provisions uh, in, in the countries where we work, uh, uh, for instance, do not uh, exclude women without an ID to register their child. But it, this, is not, this knowledge is not spread. Many, many registrars doesn't know. So the, the, there is an importance also of spreading what is the best interest. The best interest is to give all child uh, an ID document uh, and all women the opportunity to the register their child. Thank okay, you. excellent, excellent. I actually, I was intrigued by a question that Eva, Eva Bloom Dumonte has raised. Um, Eva, challenge the panel, turn on your, your audio and challenge the panel. Yeah, I, so my question, and I will keep it quite brief, is that can I you say who you are? Eva, oh yeah, sorry, I'm Eva, yes. Uh, I'm Eva Bloom Dumonte, I work for Privacy International. And so we work quite a lot on, on gender issues and I completely understand uh, the importance of, of accurate data and data that um, accurately portray uh, the challenges that uh, women are facing. But parking that aside, I uh, was also wondering uh, how the panel feels about, uh, about gender-free ID. So ID that do not have a gender marker on, on them. And the reason obviously that I'm asking this question is that we've been talking quite a lot in terms of, um, of binary. And I, I'm concerned that actually maybe ID systems may be perpetrating, perpetuating, sorry, the, this sort of binary uh, vision uh, to gender and not entirely reflecting the reality of gender, which is actually quite fluid for, for many people. And maybe instead of thinking so much about how can we allow people to have idea that, you know, uh, reflect who they are, uh, maybe parking the gender marker away from um, the physicality of ideas could be uh, could okay. be a way to address this issue. Thanks. Well, while the panel thinks about the response to this, um, let me just uh, sort of tease the issue a little bit further. You know, this is at the heart of the disaggregation data question. I mean, basically, if you are worried about certain groups being impacted, if you are not able to disaggregate the data by groups, how are you going to help them? So I'm, from my perspective, I'm intrigued by your proposal, but I feel it might be harmful because of the fact that we won't be able to know how to, to help the groups that, are, that need it most. So maybe I, I misunderstand. So if I can just address this very quickly. Uh, yeah. The fact is that already we are managing to obtain data about, for example, women not having access to ID. Even, and, and we are able to, to, to gather and collect this, this data even without the existence of our ID system. So I don't think uh, ruling out gender markers from ID entirely, uh, entirely uh, banned the possibility of, uh, of conducting uh, research and data collection based on, uh, based on gender. Any, anybody else wants to comment on this intriguing uh, proposal? Do we need gender markers as we're dealing with gender equity and equality? Yeah, uh, maybe uh, let me add my my two cents. Um, of course, bidding from what uh, uh, Joseph you have said, for me, I wouldn't say uh, I wouldn't advocate for uh, backing their gender marker. I believe it's so important to have that and understanding, having the information that are gender and sex disaggregated. We need to even know the age because the age is also an issue. But then I would have no problem if we also have another option for those who do not want to identify themselves, whether as men or, or, or women, uh, 
yeah so yeah but then i think it's so so important especially for the developing countries for us to be aware who is left behind and i'll give an example for example in tanzania and i think maybe in uh, other uh, countries uh, acquiring of a national uh, id is for 18 years and above yeah but then the statistics are showing we already have 16 to 17 youth, including female youth, who are already in the market transact and then, then they are using mobile money as their key enabler to access formal financial services. So what does it mean? So if they're not allowed, so without that information really linked to the uh, need to, of accessing IDs, then this group is uh, going to be left behind. And for us, there's help, but there's a lot, and we are now advocating for alternative ID for this group. So that by the time- We are not getting the question. The question is whether there should be female who, those that- um... who, who, is, who is speaking, sorry? Can I finish? Yeah, finish, Anna. I don't yeah, know who yeah. is speaking. Yeah. So yeah, so to me, honestly, uh, with that data, which is gender disaggregated, it's so critical. So in our case, if we don't get that information, then this youth 16 to 17 will be left behind. So that's the point mm -hmm. I wanted to put forward. But I have no okay. problem to have other kind of disaggregation for those who don't want to be identified as female or male or with their age, thanks. Eva, you, you raise an interesting question. I think the community needs to explore it from a developmental perspective and what the impact of it is. I don't think you will find universal acceptance that, that everybody will. It depends on what they're trying to do, what sector they're in. Okay, sorry, we're going to move on. Uh, Gloria, um, please state who you are, where you're coming from, and what is your perspective. Welcome to the Community Voices. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, my name is Gloria Matenge, and I'm joining you from New Caledonia in the South Pacific region. I work for the Pacific Community, which is an intergovernmental organization that supports civil registration and vital statistics systems in the Pacific region. Mm -hmm. um, so um, thank you very much to all our speakers. And I just want to add my voice to the importance of gender parity and not just uh, from the perspective of registration of births and the possession of unique ID, but also looking at death registration and the determination of causes of death and how that affects the health well-being of women, which is a critical part of, of, of their participation in society. And in particular to flag that, um, of course, women face special risks uh, related to their sexual and reproductive health and well-being related to pregnancy. And according to the WHO, we see that approximately 810 women die every day out of preventable deaths, 94% um, of which occur in low and middle income countries and a significant proportion that occur to young, and, young adolescents who face a higher risk of complications during pregnancy and childbirth. And what we see in most of the low and middle income countries is that a lot of births occur outside home and without the supervision of, of a healthcare professional, which means that they are likely to be underreported. And if they are underreported, then doctors don't get the opportunity to accurately certify what led to the death of a particular woman or a particular adolescent girl that may have fallen pregnant. Then what that means is that they, the causes of death of women are being underreported. Um, in 2016, WHO released a revised certificate of medical certification of causes of death, which includes a section allowing for um, allowing doctors to tick off whether a woman was pregnant um, within the period for which um, the death occurs, which occurred, which is very important in, you know, helping um, cipher out statistics on you know, death of mm. women due to pregnancy related causes. So I think this is another important angle in the gender discussion that right. that needs to be brought to the fore. Gloria, excellent. Let me let me just rephrase it. I mean, basically, um, what Gloria is saying is that we hear a lot about discrimination or gender uh, inequality in birth registration and an ID. But also, we should be as a community focusing on reinforcing death registration to ensure that women data 
um, and women deaths are registered as much as men. Uh, I feel um, the subject in general is a challenge because death registration is always much, much lower. Does anybody on the panel have any perspective or know of any studies where um, there is a sensitivity in, in the death registration aspect? Was anybody aware? Are you yourself? Um, I mean, obviously, birth registration is the right of the child, child protection. Um, but but in certain ways, that death registration could actually be an economic issue, not just a health issue. It could relate to inheritance and, and other, other aspects. Anybody wants to comment? If not, we can move on to the next community voice, which will be the last as we're running late. Um, yes, Dr. Atik. Um, yes, Adija. Yes, we have realized that it's uh, important for us to have access to debt registration records to be able to rest the name that we have issued in the debt registry. So we have started work on modalities of doing that, collaborating with um, the National Population Commission and the different um, court registries where death certificates are being issued to make sure at least the process by which uh, the debts will be reported to us. We, have, we know within the whole country, there's only one state that kind of enforce um, debt registration and which is legal state. So it's the only state and uh, even the registry they have, I, I don't know, we are not sure whether it is digitalized for us to have access to it. So it's part of the discussion we are having with legal state government, who is also a licensee, because some of the licensees are both private and uh, public institutions. So okay. the legal state registration agency is a licensee. And we have started that discussion since they have already that enforced within the state to start a commencement of um, death registration. The notification gets to them and uh, uh, part of the requirement is to provide the need of the deceased person so that uh, we will be able to exchange those records. Excellent. So we look forward to getting statistics in the future on yeah. the gender lens on the death registration. Um, thank you uh, for, Gloria, thank you for putting this on our agenda. It definitely will keep an eye on it. Um, actually, um, let's take the last uh, community voice, uh, Nidhi. Can you please present yourself, who you work for, and where you're coming from, and state your point? Uh, uh, thank you so much, Joseph, and thank you so much to everyone else on this panel for a fascinating discussion. Um, my name is Nidhi Parikh, and I'm a director at JPAL Africa, where, along with my team, we look at funding and generating evidence on digital ID and payment systems in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I have two thoughts. Um, one is more of an appeal, and I'm very curious to hear your reactions on those. The one, I think, is very clearly laid out what the problem is uh, when it comes to access to ID systems. Um, and I was wondering, because there's another aspect to this, is that ID in itself is not an end goal. It's also what services you access with that ID. Um, and often, so I, I, I understand that might be a second order problem, but I think it's really important to bring that into the discussion right now, so that at a later stage it's not forgotten, because often having an ID is not sufficient, it seems, to access services. So there could be other things such as tech literacy, which uh, I think Arshi mentioned, which could also be a problem even if you have an ID and accessing a cash grant and other government services. Um, and I think linked to that is my second thought, which is sort of an appeal as well. Um, I think we've talked about really interesting qualitative information and regulatory frameworks, both from the World Bank, um, FSD, uh, as well as uh, uh, what Arshi presented. Um, I'm really curious to know what your thoughts are about the use of quantitative data here. So that's what I specialize in. That's what my organization specializes in as well. Um, and I think there are lots of ideas now about what can be done, but to test out what is actually cost effective in different situations and different contexts, because those will vary, um, is quite important. Um, and I'm, just, I'm curious to know whether you think this is a good time to start looking into kind of hard quantitative data on these issues, or is it too early yet? Um, but yeah, with that, I'll stop. Those are my thoughts. And again, thank you so much. Okay. I think maybe uh, Madame Kamara, if you, si vous voulez répondre à, à cette question, 
or Lucia, if you have any perspective on, on this question. Madame Kamar, vous, vous pouvez parler en français, si vous Mer voulez. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je voulais donner euh, quand même euh, une, faire une contribution. Thank you very much. I wanted to add a contribution. Par rapport à l'enregistrement des décès, Regarding the death certificates. Death registration. Death registrations, notifications. Il est important, il est, il est important d'avoir uh, un registre uh, qui permet de sortir les personnes décédées. It's very important to have a register that allows to uh, inform, to get the information about the death. Parce or, or get them out the of the les, les femmes qui bénéficient de transferts monétaires ou d'appui financier women après that, leur décès, women that benefit from a transfer of uh, money after their, um, they die, d'autres personnes vont continuer à bénéficier de ce transfert, et à bénéficier de ces moyens, alors que ce n'était pas à eux de bénéficier, étant donné que la personne est décédée. Um, other people might benefit from this money, although it was not for them to benefit from this money after the person deceased. Donc, au lieu que le projet n'a pu uh, l'autonomisation de la femme. So, instead of um, emancipating, autonomizing the women. Ça va contribuer à enrichir d'autres personnes qui n'avaient pas le droit d'accéder à ces financements. It will contribute to enrich people that didn't, weren't allowed, that didn't have the right to access to this financing. Donc, je pense que ID for Africa devrait y penser. So I think ID for Africa should think about this. Mais il y a beaucoup de femmes qui meurent en donnant naissance. Il y a beaucoup de femmes qui meurent de famine, mais qui ne sont jamais déclarées. Many women die giving birth or die of hunger and are never... Uh, uh, documented, never notified. Yeah, I mean, this is the crossroad between gender and death. So yeah. this was between just gender, a thought. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the cross crossing of gender with death notification or death registration, which has secondary uh, effects. Going back to the to the point of, of Nidhi, um, basically, uh, it, yes, um, Nidhi, you're absolutely right. In fact, it's a it, we need to motivate women to participate in ID programs by telling them what they can do with an ID program and make sure that these ID program uses are real. Uh, Lucia has, has, has said that, um, Saloni and Arshi have said that, they said you have to communicate and show that, that the, there is an application that is real, you can vote, what does that mean? You can choose something or you can have a bank account or you can have a SIM card that allows you to have a phone, uh, mobile money. Uh, the use and communication of the use uh, are driving, I mean, the, 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 the demand will, will be driven by real applications. Uh, personally, I also think we're now uh, reaching a point where quantitative data about the participation and the different groups and how they are fearing, fear, how they are benefiting from, from ID systems is an important uh, challenge. This is why Hadija um, from NIMSI has shared with us for the first time. This is the first time we've seen the, the breakdown of what's happening. And, and I think it won't be the last time. Uh, GSMA has shared with us some data. And I think what Lucia and Evelina have done, if they have actually done these qualitative um, the, uh, interviews which add color and, and, and help us understand the depth of the problem and therefore inform the policy um, that they say Arshi, Saloni um, and Anna have been bringing to our attention. I think qualitative and quantitative data, the time has come, we need to inform policy based on facts, evidence-based. Uh, but I also acknowledge that it is a very expensive process. It's a very difficult process. I commend everybody who has been doing it. Um, we at ID for Africa will disseminate and will share all what we can about what's known about any of the problems that we're facing in our society, specifically in, in Africa. Unfortunately, um, we are way extended of, 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 uh, of the time allotted. So I'd like to end the session here by thanking once again, everybody who has stayed with us till the end. Those who haven't will catch this on, on YouTube. I hope you found the session very useful. 
I enjoyed. It has been an honor for me to actually host this session with such an illustrious uh, panel of thought leaders. So we look forward um, to continuing this dialogue going forward and to bringing in another perspective down the line. And so this is the end um, of this live cast, but not the end of the ID for Africa series. Uh, we will meet again on April 8th for the vaccination certificates. So thank you so much, everybody. And if you want the presentations from anybody, do contact us and we'll make them available. And in the meantime, um, I am asking you for a favor. Please, if you liked this session, go to, to YouTube. Uh, there is a link in the chat and like the session. The more you like the session, the more YouTube will propose it to others. Let's make sure women's um, issues are available to people outside our community. We don't wanna be just speaking to those who are already uh, practicing what we preach. We wanna reach out to the new community. So you can do something about it by going and liking the, the, this video. Thank you so much.